Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another amazing episode here on the Train on the Restaurant podcast. Today, we have an amazing guest speaker. So without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Miss Megan Barrington. What's up, girl? Hi. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so funny story with me and Megan here. We've been trying to do this podcast for a little <laughs> while and uh, just life just happens, you know, so I am so happy to have you on today because you are, like I said, incredible is what you do incredible with your knowledge on the body and just you know just thinking outside the box and really just I guess just I don't even know what word to put it as but you, you're incredible with what you do is so I'm very excited for people to learn more about you thank you um, so much absolutely and keep, keep doing what you're doing keep hustling and grinding for that um but other than that for our current listeners our future listeners can you give us like a, and it might be a long story but just give a background on kind of just how Megan got to who she is today Yeah, I'm actually going to keep it more brief than prior to when we were recording because that was a little long winded. Um, (laughs) But essentially, I am currently um, getting my doctorate of physical therapy from Baylor University. Um, Their program is hybrid. So Mm -hmm. it's uh, DPT in two. So it's a three year degree in two years. So it's kind of similar to like drinking through a fire hose. Um, So it's just freaking fast. I'm sure PT school in general is just like that. But it's pretty cool because I didn't have to move to Waco. And I do travel down there all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. And I will be traveling. I'll be living in Dallas for my first rotation. Um, But I'm I'm in Houston. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Two of my uh, classmates, like really good friends from there actually live in Houston. So. Boom. There we go. We'll be close now. (laughs) Cool. Um, Yeah. So I'm currently getting my doctorate and I previously um, was a certified athletic trainer. I still am a certified Mm. athletic trainer. Um, My master's is in athletic training and um, a strength and conditioning coach. So. My approach to physical therapy is going to be very holistic, like preventative, but also like maybe overshooting where a lot of PT would normally get people to. So like PT, a lot of the time will get people to their prior level of function, which is Mm -hmm. great. And obviously that's like what you're reimbursed for. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to bring people above that level and to take advantage of the fact that you get to teach them about their body and empower them in their body to get above that lever level of level of function, because mm-hmm. I mean, that's where they got injured, right? They got, yeah, left, right. they got injured at that level. So it's really important to just kind of resilify people. So, um, on top of that, um, I'm currently coaching still. Um, it's very part-time just because school takes up most of my time, mm-hmm. but I do, I just, I love it. I love being able to like, like people make me think more just like even people just like reaching out to me on Instagram, you know, just my Instagram has kind of grown a lot in the last year, thanks to COVID. Um, and it's been Seriously, really cool yeah. to be able to just connect with people on there, honestly, mm-hmm. which seems kind of silly if I were to say this like two years ago, but now I'm like, yeah, it's such an amazing resource, honestly, if you use it the right way. So mm-hmm. yeah, Absolutely. that's so cool. And, and, uh, I like what you said right there. You said people make you think, you know, I think that's what uh, I truly love about like this field too, because and podcasting alone, because I get to meet so many amazing people and talk to so many, you know, talented, skilled, and just passionate people, and and, um, and you know, they say something and they say something, and like even after I'm done, I'll think about that for like you know weeks or months, and I or it'll just stay there forever, and and um, you know, it makes you. I guess expand your craft or like open up new doors of your craft to think about something that like is. And it's funny because sometimes when it comes down to like movement, especially in my opinion or my experience, like doing something the correct way, right? Obviously, like the right way you're supposed to do something to prevent injury or to not get hurt. That's how you should do something. But then there's also a different way to attack maybe the same movement or the same group to achieve the same result. But you're kind of maneuvering or like changing just a little bit of something else so that you can attack something even more or amplify it. I think that's what's so cool about this is like you can always adjust and move and, and uh, amplify something to be, I guess, better. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, if you really understand and like, I am learning, I'm constantly learning about movement. Obviously I'm in PT school. So again, I said fire hose learning about movement right now. Um, <laughs> but like, if you know, if you recognize what someone is missing, then uh-huh. you can find a way, like, I love the problem solving aspect of it because yes. you're like, okay, this person can do this exercise and another person can do the same exercise, but they look totally different. Yes. Maybe one person needs something different than the other person. So, you know, your, your extrinsic cues 
Mm. Um, typically are more useful for people rather than like being like flex this muscle. You tell them like, Mm. Oh, move this here or Mm -hmm. go towards this direction, you know? Um, so I mean, it's, it can be frustrating at times, obviously, but I'm like constantly tinkering with my own training and like with my clients. Um, and what, like my favorite part of coaching people is when like, you see like the little light bulb. Yes. Like, like, you're not just like passively being like, okay, do this. And then like not paying attention. <laughs> Actually, my clients will tell you this. I am like the world's shittiest counter. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not, am I allowed to swear? I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah. This is yeah. explicit here. <laughs> I, I like, I can't even count my own reps, honestly. Cause I don't really care about it. No one cares how many reps you're doing. If like, they all look different. Uh-huh. Or, or if like your form was going to shit or if, right. like, or if you just don't have a really good connection. So I don't right. count very well. I've been trying to get better. Um, but I was going to say it just the quality of movement and mm-hmm. like the stimulus that you're actually giving your body is far more important than the number of reps that you do. Unless, Absolutely. unless you're at the point where like every rep looks the same and then you can use it to overload, but that's not most people. That's, you know what? No, exactly. Okay. So funny story, I guess I am, my clients will say if, cause I coach people, right? So I'm like, more of like weight loss, athletic training, performance-based strength and conditioning. I like to, you know, help people shred fat, build muscle, sculpt their body the way they want to be sculpted, just be healthy perhaps too, or just, or excel in their sport, whichever it is. But whenever I'm, I run like groups too. So when I coach one person, sometimes my reps will be off, you know, I'd be like, Hey, we're going to hit, you know, this specific rep. And then I'd be like, all right, two more. And they're like, no, dude, we got like uh, one more. This is my last one. Or I'm like, no, I swear, dude, this is, we're here. But either way, um, when I, when I do my boot camp, I'm coaching like, you know, a few people. And for some reason I can count three people's reps at one time better than I can count one person. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know how that makes sense at all. It doesn't make no sense to me. For you. Yeah. Yeah. That's like something completely different. But, um, but yes, I think uh, obviously what you said too is very powerful. It's like with the repetition and, and you know, what, that's something whenever we talk to different people or see different things, makes you think differently. And I never really thought of it the way that you just said with the stimulation of like understanding, I guess the mind to body connection, especially when you go through a specific movement, like the repetition, I feel like people are so focused on repetition, right? They focus on like, how much can I, how many reps can I do of this specific mm-hmm. load or this specific weight or, you know, what is my volume count? But it's like, if you were to do a push up and you took a minute to do it and you focus on every single fiber going down and every single fiber coming up, you all you did was one rep you know, mm-hmm. you, your mind and body connection throughout that movement, you know, focusing on your pectorals, you know, delts, tricep, like all these specific things that utilize you or make you do that push up. The stimulation there is going to be so much more powerful or aggressive than you doing, you know, 50 repetitions and 10 of those being great. And then the rest of them being out of whack and you're not focusing on the specific muscle groups that you need to, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. So I think, Agreed. I think that's very, that's, that's powerful. Well, that's, that's like the, what you just said is like, I never really thought of it like that, but the way that you said it. So I think that's really good. Um, but when it comes down to like movement, is there like a specific, what got you into wanting to, do, to work with movement? Like where I possibly, I'm almost certain that you were an athlete or are very active, obviously, but like, was there something that like an injury or maybe a family member got injured or something happened where you just got fascinated with movement? Yeah. Um, well, I was really fortunate to have, parents who like my mom just loves to like work out in general my dad like loves to hike so he will work out in order to be able to do like manual labor and hike and things like that um so I was really fortunate just to be raised in a very active household which I think is huge um Mm. for anyone to like their trajectory forward um Mm. not to say you can't become fit and active without that but it's really helpful to have that as a background yes um and then in high school we had to do I was an athlete I played volleyball year-round I played tennis I did track for like a short stint um but volleyball was like my life pretty much And I, if you're a varsity athlete, you were required to take zero period weights. And I was one of the only girls in my class that like actually was like into it. Like I really liked it. And then, you know, when I, when I went to undergrad, um, I went to the university of Washington, which if anybody is familiar, it is a massive campus. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was walking all over campus. Uh, I was also running a lot. Like I got really into running, um, and just like a lot of cardio in general. Um, okay. I actually, I coach classes at my, at that gym, at my, uh, student gym, like introductory weight training. So I was like into weight training, but like, there's no way I was like actually getting any progress because I was running, I was expending so much yeah. energy and having to recover from like all my, like 
honestly, very toxic habits of cardio. Right. Um, not to say cardio is bad, but I'm just saying I was doing it for like <laughs> control reasons, which is not the right way to do it. Right, right, right. Um, right. I'll see. So anyway, and then when I moved to New Zealand to be a nanny in between undergrad and grad school, long story there, but essentially yeah, I, you. I, I got a bunch yeah, of stuff. I'm seriously all over the place. Um, whenever I tell this to people, I'm like, wow, I like, I mean, I'm proud of it and I'm happy to have the experience that I have, but like, yes. what, the heck, what the heck am I doing? Um, so I actually did get really into a strength training and I think it was because the gym that I was at was just like this, like grungy powerlifting gym. Oh, yes. That, the people there and they're Kiwis. So they're just cool people in general. Yeah, yeah. Like they just like, they really just like encouraged me to fall in love with it. And so there was probably where I got most in love with it. And then when that's I moved to cool, Arkansas so cool. for grad mm -hmm. school, again, same story. My gym was really supportive. Actually, a lot of people in that gym were bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. So I actually wound up starting, I began competing in bikini, um, in the bikini. Oh, wow. Really? really? Yeah. It's funny. Like if you scroll way down on my Instagram, uh -huh. it was all selfies and like a little bit of workouts. Um, and honestly, bodybuilding is something that I have an amazing respect for, um, especially yes. because I've, I've done it and I've been through that. And I know people like, especially now, cause like functional, I'm using quotations. If this isn't on camera, functional fitness is like all the rage now, but like uh -huh. everything goes in trends, not to say being functional yes. is, you know, that's always gonna be important, yeah, but yeah. a lot of, a lot of my connection and my principles are actually from my bodybuilding background. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that it's actually been a, a kind of a strength for me from like a rehab standpoint or a strength and conditioning standpoint, because I think there's, there's just so much value in having like multi faceted background, you know, oh, like yeah. if you just all are you, you're gung ho down one rabbit hole, like you're going to be really good at those things, obviously. But like, if you ever have to swerve or adapt or like think differently, you, you don't have that capability. So, right. um, I don't even remember your original question. Oh, <laughs> how I got into lifting. So yeah, that's, I mean, and yeah. then I, <laughs> after the last time I competed was actually in 2018. Um, and I just, I kind of took a step back because I just, I was exhausted with it and like, wasn't really sure if like, I wanted to like try to go get my pro card just because mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if I wanted to do what you have to do to be able to do that. Um, yes, right. Just a, p a personal decision. Like it's still on the table. Like there's, there's times that I miss it for sure. Um, and I will always have the utmost respect for anybody that decides to get on stage. Mm. Uh, but I took a break and just like completely 360. I did. Uh, are you familiar with strong first? Strong? F no. Uh, uh. So it's a hard, it. hard style kettlebell. Um, uh oh is it the uh the I one guess? with like they have like animal uh no know. that's uh i don't know what that is but there's a there's a lot of kettlebell certification like rkc is another one but there's like oh okay okay, okay, okay. basically it's a kettlebell so coaching certification and yeah, right. versus, like in my opinion like their certification i trained for six months for it you have to test perfectly with five of their move or there's five how many are there? No, there's six. There's six tests. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a seventh test, which is the snatch test, which is essentially oh, nice. you, I had to use a 35 pound kettlebell mm -hmm. um, and you have to do hundred snatches in five minutes. So 50, oh, 50 my you don't have to, yeah. So, and I didn't put the bell down once just Hell saying, yeah, Good job. I definitely, definitely could not do that now. But then I was like, I am not putting this thing down. Cause I'm usually I didn't want to like, I didn't want to have to like figure out how much time I had to rest. You know, you just yeah, like, you yeah, yeah. rest and just do it. But anyway, so, and then you also have to take a written test. So it's just, okay. I really, really respect that company and like the way that they, they pursue coaching and just the way they teach movement, honestly, like there's mm -hmm. a lot of things that like they teach with like the hinge and the squat and like ballistic movements and breathing and that are just, it's like so easy to digest if you don't have a background in like science, like right. a lot of the coaches don't have a background in science. Um, but it's just, it's legit. It's 100% legit. And they have like a body weight certification and a barbell certification, which I haven't done either of those. Um, but yeah, so that was just like a 360, like totally just going for function, like training for power mm -hmm. for like mm -hmm. the first mm -hmm. time ever, honestly, unless mm -hmm. like in high school I did, uh, from bodybuilding. So and then I've just, I've, I've worked in like rehabilitative settings for a long time, just because of my, my career and my, right. my current in process career. And so right. I've just kind of mixed like all these different like realms together. And so I, I think that that's kind of where my style comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And then most recently last year, actually, thanks to quarantine. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Katie St. Clair. No, but that last name is, is familiar. Yeah. Sure. So she, she actually 
pretty much changed the way that I think as far as like how I coach. Um, she has a program called Empowered Performance and mm -hmm. it is, I think she's actually opening it to men now because a lot of men were like, I want to take it. But like originally it was <laughs> only for women and she right. basically, it was 12 weeks of like uh, lecture and like just learning about like all different parts of the body, all different parts of movement and mm -hmm. functional anatomy essentially. And then also okay. exercise programming. Right. So she's been a CSCS for like 20 years and is just, she's married to a physical therapist and she's just a badass. Like she's, she was a former gymnast, but like oh, hasn't oh, really damn. like, she obviously hasn't been a gymnast for a long time, but she's like 42 and can like do all this crazy shit. And like, it's because That's awesome. She, has just she's just awesome and i learned yes. a ton from her and i'm so grateful that like 2020 happened when it did because mm -hmm. i took her course because i didn't have anything else to do because i was essentially unemployed um <laughs> and then now i'm in pt school and i feel like i just you, you I used a, it yeah i've used it and i've used yeah. everything else that i've learned as well obviously like my master's degree has helped a ton with like orthopedic stuff mm -hmm. um but it's just it's just cool to have that that background i think it just helps me to think more more critically Right. So whenever, and that, that's cool. I, I think that's so cool. So you said Kate St. Clair? Kate? Katie, Katie St. Clair. Yeah. You Katie need to have St. her Claire. on. Oh yeah. yeah dude, I'll definitely. Yeah. Read that. that sounds cool. She's awesome. She's super um, awesome. That's cool. St. Clair. That's a badass last name. Um, but, uh, so whenever, <laughs> whenever it comes down to, um, okay. Bodybuilding. Let's see if this question makes sense. Bodybuilding and functional training mm -hmm. out of both of them, which, which one do you feel like, in your opinion, is more lifestyle related? Like you can take these things and use it in everyday life. Yeah. So in my opinion, um, bodybuilding should be, I mean, I understand the principles in like isolating movements because you want to bring up a certain body part and you need to increase volume. Like that's, that's valuable. Right. Um, but in my opinion, like what do we, what is bodybuilding based on? It's based on like the perfect human form, right? Yes. Perfect human form involves proportioned human muscles, which in my opinion should be developed by human movement, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say functional, but like, I don't know. I, I just feel like <sighs> functional for sure. Functional yeah. for sure. But with a spin on like, hey, I want to have nice glutes. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> I mean, I just, I think that they should be one and the same. Like I really don't, like if I go to like a commercial gym, I don't see, there's nothing wrong with machines, um, but I don't really use them just because I don't the feel same. like the need for them. I hardly do any like isolated movements for the most mm. part. I mean, I guess I do, but, and mm. there's definitely value in it, especially for, like I said, just adding volume, which obviously you understand that. Right. Um, but I would say for most people in general, um, if you were to do more functional, like triplane, which everything is triplanar, but like mm -hmm. if you were to focus more on like moving in the frontal plane and like mm -hmm. moving in the transverse plane, your mm -hmm. sagittal plane kind of takes care of itself. If you do single leg yeah. movements and like multi-directional movements, your double leg movements are kind of going to take care of themselves and it doesn't necessarily go the other way. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, if we are walking, like we spend time on two feet, but like, mm -hmm. if we're running, we're on one foot at a time. So right. if we want to be functional, like we don't spend our lives just like standing still stationary or mm -hmm. most of us sit around all the time. I'm one of those people right now. Cause I'm in school. <laughs> um, but I think just teaching people how taking the principles of human movement, like gait and yes. just applying that to training, I think is really valuable. Um, you know, alternating movements, uh, but you can mm. also like, there's nothing wrong with, and I think that you should load people yes. and load yeah, them yes. a lot. And you can't mm -hmm. necessarily, or don't necessarily want to load like some of those patterns a ton, just because it's, it's like, it's not loaded in gate, you know? Mm. Yeah, so yes. yeah, I, I think that functional definitely for the majority of people. And I think that most people would actually develop a physique that they are really happy with um, if they were to train functionally like and mm -hmm. by functional i just mean like multi-planar and mm -hmm. unilateral movements right yeah no absolutely 100 percent. and whenever it comes i guess in my opinion too whenever it comes down to like functional and like bodybuilding type like i guess isolation and multi-joint movements it's like to if you want to get better on a back squat Yes, you could do back squats and just do back squats, right? But if you were to then isolate specific muscle groups that enhance your back squat, then you could improve your back squat. It, 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 when, even when it especially comes down to like the stabilizer muscles, you know, um, I think that's when like isolation bodybuilding kind of does come into effect a little bit, kind of helps 
the functional multi, you know, joint movements and stuff like that. Um, but I, I, I agree to you. I think functional is obviously more like lifestyle, but you did say something like with being on both feet and one foot. So, and lately I've been doing a lot of, I guess, one-sided, you know, single leg or single arm things. Mm -hmm. And it, even, even coming down to like holding a dumbbell, like for bicep curls, for example, holding one dumbbell, not holding anything on the other side, like not, nothing on the other hand and doing curls on one side but not letting like my body tilt to that side as i'm doing a curl and i found that it has helped my curl when i'm doing it with both on an easy bar or a barbell so in in asking you in your opinion do you think it's better i guess better in improving lifts and also kind of preventing injury understanding how to utilize specific muscle groups do you think it's really good to train with like one legged things or even one arm things or one sided movements then both together. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say so. I would say the reason that you probably improved in like being able to just hold your, I'm assuming you meant like hold your torso stiff with a bilateral yes. curl after doing single. Yeah. Cause you obviously yes. have to use the, the core for anti-rotation if you're holding one side. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, also if you're lopsided, you have to just irradiate more tension throughout your whole mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. Um, and not to say that like, and I'm one of those people that like, I'm go, go, go. I'm type A. I am definitely like an overachiever, yeah. um, which <laughs> is awesome. Sure. Whatever. But also I need to learn how to chill out. And that's currently what I'm working on. Uh -huh. um, but I was going to say, we well, shouldn't need to just be like tense all the time. And in sports, like it's not that you're, you're not, you don't need to be tense. Like you don't need to brace your core all the time. You need to be able to relax your core and brace it with good timing. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you're not just like being explosive doesn't involve just like being rigid all the time. So, <laughs> right. um, I think that doing unilateral movements is, is just uh -huh. beneficial in general because you also can see like, uh, you know, imbalances and work on your imbalances. You know, I mean, there's, there's certain things that like are kind of always going to be imbalanced, like in the human body. But I think right. that like, especially like things like a Bulgarian split squat or just like a split squat in general, a lot of mm -hmm. people have a harder time on one side. Um, right. it could be that that side is just really weak, or it could be the fact that the back leg, that mm -hmm. back hip flexor or that pelvis is like in a position that is like basically cranking you like yes. that side. And so it's difficult for you to like stay straight on the other side. Oh. So right. it's just really, really performative. Like you can use movements as obviously ways to train, and yes. strengthen and develop muscle um, and patterns, but like also you can use them to like figure out like what the hell is going on here. Like you can take someone's range of motion, or you can have them do something and be like, okay, mm -hmm. so what's happening here that isn't happening on the other side? You know. So I would say definitely bilateral movements. Like, plus, I mean, for like a time time standpoint, like if someone has limited time to train, okay, right, right. Um, that's one thing where like I'm like, okay, well, I think being competent in single plane bilateral movements is not going to mm -hmm. really lend itself anywhere else besides that specific movement. Mm -hmm. But whereas doing unilateral, you can use your rest time to do the other side. Right. So you um, just kind of just go back, back, back. Yeah. Unless your heart needs break or like, <laughs> if you like actually want to like be able to properly sure. break, you need more time to rest. So that's one thing, like if you're short on time, uh -huh. um, I don't know. That's getting into the weeds a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, but no, no, definitely, definitely. I think that's a huge benefit too. And whenever you're doing one-sided movements compared to both, you know, um, and whenever it comes down to like finding an imbalancement, cause whenever, and I, it'd be cool to hear your experience too. Actually, you know what? Let's hear yours first. Whenever you get someone and let's take the squat, for example, cause I've seen a lot of crazy squats out there that, um, make no sense, you know? And, so whenever you get someone, just random, okay, John Doe, Jane Doe, whoever, um, you get someone and you see the first squat from this person and it's just crazy, right? Like on the toes, you know, knees over toes, bent back, like everything just like everything wrong in a squat. How, how would you kind of break that down? How would you kind of help that person understand how to properly do a squat? Yeah. So it's so hard because it's obviously like, if it's just a complete disaster, it's kind of like, okay, well, what do we fix first? Um, yeah, let's so say complete disaster, I, just so hectic. Say it's a complete disaster. I think <laughs> what I often do, and this is just with people that I work with in general, because a lot of time they've never squatted before. So right. it's not necessarily like they kind of do what they think they see. It's kind of mm. like, if you're drawing, you draw what you think should be there rather than like what <laughs> right. you actually see. And that's you're not going like, to have a picture hell? that looks like what you're actually drawing. If you don't just like look at the lines, you know? Um, right. Right. Trace so, that sucker. 
I would say, yeah. <laughs> yeah or you can do that. That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> um, squatting to me, like a lot of people try to like hinge their squat. Uh, mm-hmm. which if you're a power lifter, I think you should be doing that. Cause it's like the right, range of right. motion. You can lift more weight. Um, yep. but if you're not a power lifter, you should probably be training like a squat and mm. a hinge separately. Mm. So a lot of the time oh, okay. I, See, I will, I'll load them front, like goblet. Um, okay. and I'll also put something like not even a box, but like a, a ball, like a medicine ball or something mm. that's like just underneath them. It doesn't even mm. have to be, they don't even have to touch it. If mm-hmm. I just tell them that it's there they somehow wind up being able to move in the way that I want them to. And like, I could be like, right. okay, do this. And it just looks uh-huh. like complete shit. And then I have them like, <laughs> okay, hold this here. Don't fall over and try to put your butt on this thing. And then it's like, go magic. For it. it's beautiful. It's a beautiful squat. It so is. that's what I'm saying by like extrinsic cues. Like they're so uh-huh. helpful. Um, mm-hmm. If they're like shifting to the side, which is super common. Like I do that. Um, you probably do it. I think it's pretty common. Um, yeah, I know it is there's ways that you can just sort of like facilitate getting onto the side. That's like not doing its job. You can think about it more. You can almost like think in your brain, like overcompensate towards that side. That can be helpful sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time what I'll do, like say someone is like kind of sitting down onto their right side. If you put that right foot forward just a little bit, like, I don't know, like a toes length or maybe even less than that. Got it. Got it. They squat. They end up like being more onto that left side. It's almost like a, like a kickstand, like single yeah. leg like squat, right? So right, they're right. obviously still even enough that they can load like heavy, um, but they're just facilitating just a little bit more of that hip shift into the left. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, like sometimes things don't, like you can think things are going to work in your head as a coach and they obviously don't. So you try the opposite thing or you right. just like, it's just, <laughs> again, it's constant problem solving. Like there'd be many things mm-hmm. that are going wrong. Like it could be that they're not putting weight, like they're not thinking about putting weight into their great toe or Mm -hmm. the ball of their foot or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, There's just, there's obviously so many things that could go wrong, but I think a lot of the time what people need is to stop thinking about what they see and just like do like, like what I was saying about like sitting down onto something, Yeah, you know, right. right, Monkey see monkey do, which is obviously beneficial sometimes, but it's like monkey feel. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's like the only I feel like that will be the only powerful way because if you see me do something and obviously I've been doing, we've been training, I've been, I've been training for 13, 14 years. So I know how to do specific things. This person's brand new. This is week one. They're not going to see me and all of a sudden understand how to do it. You know, we, we do need to make them understand because they have their own central nervous system, their own things. And they need to understand how to, you know, where your body's going, you know, where your hips are going, where you're hinging, you know, where you're flexing, you're extending all these different things and feel where your body's going through in this plane of motion. Um, and I get, yeah, the only best way to do it is just to feel it. You got to feel it, you know? Um, and, and, and that's cool. I like how you, you know, like I said, see that moving that foot forward, even just a little bit, if you're tilting to one side, I think that's, see, that's something I never would have thought about. You know, most of the time I always go to single, like I, I singleize that leg and I try to focus on like, if I'm tilting or trying to focus on if I'm not using my glute as much or trying to figure out what I'm doing more on the other side than, than this side, you know? So that's, uh, that's great insight. I like that. Um, whenever you say a lot about the eccentric portions of your, of the movement and stuff, do you feel like where, where is the, the portion of the lift where people can gain the most improvement as in like understanding the movement more, will it be in the eccentric portion or the concentric movement? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, yeah, I know. Cause I, even the other day I was trying to, you know, why I asked you that. Cause the other day I'm thinking to myself, like I'm out there yeah. training. I'm like, you know, I'm trying to fix So right now. My bench is like something that's really bugging me. And I'm like, dude, I, I feel like I'm getting everything here, but for some reason, my PR, they go gradual, very small, like increments. And I feel like it's because of, my position on the bench or my position here and there. And I try to focus on like the eccentric more, the, uh, coming down part than yeah. going up, you know, but then I'm like, I wonder what part of this movement is actually going to give me the most benefit when understanding the movement more. Yeah. I actually think the eccentric, um, yeah, right. and that's because not only does like, obviously with your, with an eccentric controlled movement, you're going to have to just hold tension and slow weight down a lot of the time weight that is heavier than weight that you could lift like concentrically. If you're actually mm-hmm. doing like eccentric overload. Um, right, another right. thing is that people often like bounce out of the bottom, which mm-hmm. is use. That's what a plyometric is, mm-hmm. right? You want to be able yeah. to like load and then spring off the, off the rubber band. But with something where you're not trying to do a plyometric, like a squat, if you go 
down to the bottom and then bounce out of the bottom. You're not necessarily, you're not getting those glutes to use to, to work at the length and state you're mm. using momentum, right? You're using right. your joints essentially, or your mm. tendons. Um, so I would say being able to slow down the eccentric and pause at the bottom and then, then mm. reverse, like just like a mirror, this, the eccentric and the concentric, the trajectory should look exactly the same. A lot of the mm. time with someone at, at the bottom of a squat, you'll see their ne- knees come back first and their hips come up, right, which right. just indicates that they're like extending their knees before they're extending their hips. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas with a squat, you should be extending them at the same time. Mm. Um, and I was going to say something else. Uh, dang. You got it. You got it. Bring I know. it in. Uh, Bring it in. Um, you got it. But Squat, with, plyometric, yeah. eccentric, concentric. It's coming. I can feel it. Yeah, I don't know. I'll probably okay, come back to gone. it. But yeah, so I, I mean, that is that is what I think as far as like the eccentric goes. Mm-hmm. Um, concentric, you can definitely benefit from, but I, I feel like eccentric is probably where you're going to be able to like breakthrough plateaus and things like that. And yes, also just right. being able to absorb force. Yeah, like a mm-hmm. lot of people, it kind of depends on the person too. Like some people are good at absorbing and not good at like propelling and exploding. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I'm one of those people. I'm very, very loosey goosey. I can just absorb all day, but like you asked me to like stiffen up and propel and I'm shitty. So yeah. a lot of people are the opposite. A lot of people are like so stiff that they like can't lengthen um, yeah. certain places. So like a muscle has to lengthen before it contracts. Right. It's going to like do anything. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you want to have like a lot of these people that are just doing like nothing wrong with like hip thrusts or anything like that. But like, would you do a bicep curl, like starting here? I mean, if you're doing like entry, <laughs> like a 21, like right. I'm just holding it there. Cause obviously the camera is a weird place, but if you're doing like a 21, you do those like mini, like you do seven reps like that. And then seven reps in the like full range of motion. Right. Right. But you wouldn't like, it's just a component. So if you are only training a muscle in like, it's like mid range to shorten state, mm-hmm. you're missing out on like a lot of that, like mid range to lengthen state, which we're oh, weak right. at our shorten and lengthen states. Mm-hmm. So you might be able to feel a squeeze really well. And that's mm-hmm. great. But it's like, you're kind of missing out on function if you're not able to like lengthen a muscle and be able to contract it from that length, length, length and position, like our right. When we're walking, our glutes are like most active, right? When we're, we strike mm-hmm. our heel and we have to like prevent our hip from just going into hip flexion. Mm-hmm. So, and they're lengthened there. So I just feel like people could benefit from paying attention to the eccentric portion and owning it and then being able to reverse out of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and obviously too, a lot of people understand that the eccentric portion of the lift is like where you get the most fiber ever tear down, you know? So if you wanted to grow the muscle or get it more dense and more lean, like the eccentric portion is where you're going to want to focus more on. Um, I remember and- what I was going to say. Say it, go. <laughs> I just remembered. Okay. So and another thing with the eccentric, um, this helped me a ton with pull-ups. Um, okay. So if you're doing a pull-up uh-huh. and if you're doing an overhead press, they're pretty similar. If you were just yep. to, like, look at the shoulder joint, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is the shoulder joint. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you think about when I'm like lowering myself down from a pull-up, like eccentrically, uh-huh. mm-hmm. I think about pushing like, like an overhead press. Cause that's what my shoulders are doing. They're, they're moving as if I was pressing overhead. So okay. what another thing that you could take advantage of in an eccentric, like with bench, it would be like your lats. You're like uh-huh. lowering it down to your chest. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just, get your brain. Cause your, your joint is like, you're still controlling with those, those muscles that are like off right. or actually, I guess they could be on if you're eccentrically controlling with the other ones. Right. Um, right, right. But it's just, it's a way that like, I had never thought of it before. Um, shout out to Anthony Amott, who was my coach for strong first, but there you go. Um, it helped me with a hard style pull-up, which has like completely changed the game for my pull-up volume. Cause if I just use my lats, like I'm a girl, so my lower body is a lot heavier than my upper body. So like, Mm -hmm. it's hard for me to pull, but if I'm able to like use my pushing muscles and use my core and use my glutes and my thighs, like in a pull-up, like it's just really helpful. So being able to like, not just pay attention to the muscle that's lengthening, but to think about the muscles that are opposing that muscle as well, that can be a really good thing to tap into with eccentric. And it could actually help like with your bench. Um, I don't know if you've ever thought about like your back when you're doing it, but yeah, no, absolutely. I, that's why I warm up my upper back before I do a bench, just to kind of like get everything going. As you're talking right there, you know what's funny? Whenever you, um, whenever, see, every time I try to talk about something, I, I don't want to lose my thought. I close my eyes because if I see too many things, I'm going to forget about what I'm saying. <laughs> but um, 
so with whenever your body gets tired, right, and the muscle fatigues, your body is so smart, man. Your body will recruit different things. Same thing when it comes down to a specific muscle group. Your body will recruit different fibers if you're doing something, you know, uh, plyometric, uh, um, isometric, or if you're doing something that's different than just a regular eccentric, concentric movement. Like your body has to, that's why you got different fibers in one muscle group so you can recruit different things. But that makes sense what you just said. Because instead of letting your lats fatigue and then recruiting other muscle groups to help in your movement because you're tired and then now that's when the pull-up looks like crap because like your lats are done and maybe the lats are the primary mover in that movement, right? Then if you were to understand how to recruit those other muscle groups, just like you're saying, like, why should I, you know, activate my glutes or my core for a pull-up? Like that doesn't make any sense. But then you're going to notice that maybe it stops your swaying or maybe it stops you from doing different things in the pull-up motion going up and down, right? So recruiting those different muscle groups to help the primary muscle group do the movement. Also, I feel like fatigue won't be as extreme as obviously, but then understanding how to get better in that movement will also help just like what you just said with it is the same thing. If I were to... The, if you were to do nothing, right, there would be no bar, no press, nothing, and you were just to stand there and do the motion, it'd be the same thing with you having a barbell pressing overhead and you having a pull-up bar pulling over, you know, like your motion would be the same. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I, I was just actually thinking, I don't know if this is like true or not, but I'm wondering if maybe thinking about pushing yourself down as you are controlling eccentrically with the lats helps like mitigate how it, fatigued they get. I don't know. I mean, it's a theory. But right, because I know takes, that I can do more reps. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. I I don't know if that would work in a push up too, though. You think it would work in a push up because you're going against gravity, like yeah, gravity's against your side. I like. It's funny when I do push ups. I'm getting better because I'm like doing more like targeted <laughs> bench work and chest work. Uh-huh. But like when I do push ups, a lot of the time my lats will be tired. Which I know that you, they're they're working, obviously. I think you're but, flexing them so hard, probably. You're just like yeah, I'm like always crap flexing my lats. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. So I think it could work with a, with a push up too. Try it. Let me know. That's crazy. Yeah, I'll definitely know. I'll be shout to to Megan Barrington. <laughs> um, so you know, I, I want to ask you something too. Whenever I, I I was talking to a chiropractor one time, and he told me some crazy shit, and I was like, j- not crazy because it doesn't make any sense, but crazy just because I'm like what like it just didn't make sense to me but when it comes down to alignment okay like body alignment right and then like flexibility so i guess we can kind of wrap this up into like range of motion perhaps Mm -hmm. but the conversation started with him having tight hamstrings so he has tight hamstrings i'm like why don't you just stretch them out so that you can you know have more flexibility in your hamstrings and then he would be like you know well why would i stretch my hamstrings out if i do a squat and i'm in good alignment and I'm like, well, because like maybe like joint health or this and that. And you're like, well, if you're in proper alignment, when you do a movement, even with tension somewhere, you are still doing the movement with proper alignment. And and that like boggled my mind. So I was like, I, I think he's right. But then again, like why have tight hamstrings when you could fix it with flexibility? Because I'd like didn't just stretch it out. And he'd be like, I don't, I don't waste my time stretching because if you're in proper alignment, then why stretch? You're not going to get hurt. You're in proper alignment. And I'm like, Okay, this is making any sense, but it did after a little while. But I still do stretching because that's what I I like to do. But coming yeah. from you, if I were to like after sharing you that story, what what would be your point of view on that? If you are in proper alignment, you think there's even a need to kind of like focus on flexibility? Um, so I don't really stretch like ever personally. Uh, so I don't. Think it's good anything- to hear your story. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, I do mm. think that if you do it before you work out, you're probably going to get injured. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sport, definitely don't do it before a sport. Um, but there's All nothing right. wrong with it. It can be really good to help like wind down the nervous system and just kind of assess like how your tissues are feeling. Um, however, I completely agree with the chiropractor in that like, so a lot of time people's hamstrings feel tight because mm-hmm. of the position of their pelvis. Cause your hamstrings mm-hmm. are attached to your pelvis at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And so if your pelvis is an anterior tilt, which let's be real, most of us are sitting like that, especially yep. if you scroll through the Instagram, um, your hamstrings are going to feel tight because they are being stretched. So you do the last thing you need to do is stretch them. They are stretched. Uh-huh. They don't need to be tight, like stretched uh-huh. anymore. Um, uh-huh. There are situations where hamstrings are actually shortened. You know, if someone, it was like super posteriorly tilted, their knees were flexed. That would be an right. indication that their hamstrings are actually short. 
Um, mm. but that's like not most people. Most people mm. are in hyper extension of their knee even, or just like normal knee extension. And then right. their hamstrings are just being yanked on from the upper part of their pelvis. Oh, oh. So mm. I think we could benefit a lot more from being able to, if you are getting in positions where your pelvis is more neutral. So like your pelvis was like a bowl of water or cereal or whatever liquid faux cereal the weather Hell here yeah. is really crappy. So I'm going to say faux, um, <laughs> but, or fa, 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 sorry. I, yeah, whatever. Anyway, some you of that liquid, <laughs> you're not dipping the pelvis forward, which is what we're doing. And that obviously is another reason that people can limit hit or have limitations in hip flexion too. Cause you're already there. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at like your femur in the acetabulum and your pelvis is forward, you're essentially like already flexed. You just haven't yes. had a chance to move your femur into flexion. But right. if you try to do it, you're going to get pinching, right? Cause you're mm-hmm. like running out of room. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you were to get your pelvis backwards, which you can do with your abs, which most people have really weak lower abs, right? Um, flex them, flex or, the hip, right? Tuck the pelvis with the abs mm-hmm. or Get your, sorry, my phone graph, right, or get your hamstrings, your proximal hamstrings to help pull that pelvis yes. into more of a neutral tilt, mm-hmm. um, which I would argue also like true hip extension, you need to have the hamstrings pull the pelvis into posterior tilt, and then mm-hmm. the glutes move the femur backwards. So you're right. combining the pelvis movement with the femur movement. Mm-hmm. Um, so you actually get that like joint to extend. Um And like your hamstrings are going to be shortened in that position. So if you can, a lot of like tension and pain, actually all pain is from your nervous, like your brain feels pain, your body doesn't feel pain. Your brain's like, oh shit, something's wrong. We need to like alert, alert, alert. Yeah. Make make this thing hurt. So this person (laughs) stops doing this pain or like tension in the muscle. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time can just be because your body's like, Hey, we should, uh, change this up. Like this isn't good. You know? Right. Um, Something's wrong. Yeah. And if you're in that position, when you're like all the time, when you're squatting or deadlifting, Mm -hmm. um, we need range, right? We need to be able to anteriorly and posteriorly tilt, especially like in athletics, like a lot of athletics are based on like extension. You need to be able to get in that position. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we're stuck there, that's where you're going to have those hamstrings that always feel tight. And you're right. going to be like, you're one of those people where if you go into like what you think is a hinge, mm-hmm. you're like, oh, my hamstrings. I'm like, okay, tuck your tailbone a little bit. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I feel my butt. Like, yes. what? like right. that's why, like if you, if you tip over and your hamstrings are just being like yanked on and held on for deal life, you're obviously going to have, <laughs> like there's your brain's going to be like, life. uh, hello, we're going to tear. You need to stop, you know? So yeah. That's kind of what tension you can come from. Again, you can still, you can totally have tight hamstrings, but a lot of time it is a chronic result. That feeling is a chronic result of the position that you're stuck in and mm-hmm. your body doesn't want to be there. So, right. That's so yeah. funny. Whenever you, whenever you break it down into like, you know, um, things like that, like your body can already be in an extension or even a flexion portion without you even doing anything. That's just you being natural. Um, you know, I, I think that's crazy because and then with someone who doesn't know what those things are, they go into a movement or they start their first training program and all of a sudden all these injuries start popping up and they're like, what the hell is wrong? Like, you know, is it this, is it that? And then they start blaming this and that. And don't get me wrong. Sometimes people are coaching people too extreme and, you know, whatever the case may be. But then, you know, we're sitting with injury that's waiting to happen already. That's why I think it's so powerful that we self-educate ourselves in these specific movements. And just like what you're saying with the glute activation, like to test it out, very simple Everyone knows, especially females, they know what a kickback is, right? Whenever you're doing something for your glutes, straighten your leg out. If you were to flex the hips down, your leg won't go as far as it would if you were just moving your hips with it. And you would feel the glute activation. You would feel that glute activation so much more extreme. And you think that that range of motion is limited because you're not going as far. But that is as far as your you know, I guess you would say femur to to hip ratio would allow it to go through. And, you know, that those degrees that it allows it to go through. Totally. And your butt doesn't look as good, but it will when you're not working out. So yeah. that's, what, that's what we want, right? <laughs> that's what you want, man. You want that peach. But um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's that's so cool. What wh- why did you start put, putting stuff on your on your Instagram? What wh- did you want to like? What, what is what is the stuff you're trying to push out there for people? Yeah, I'm trying to think about that because like I've had Instagram for forever, like since undergrad, mm-hmm. so like 10 years. But yep. um, when I was competing, I would post a lot of like just 
like when you're dieting to an extreme, your brain, you get super emotional, super like you just need help. Passionate. <laughs> well, no, I'm just like, I was fired up all the time. And it wasn't like I was complaining. It was oh, just, like, oh, no. I just felt really driven, you know? So I would yes. like share just like my thoughts on things. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like, not like I'm trying to be inspirational, but it was sort of my diary, you know, yeah, 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 um, yeah, along, along with like a selfie or like a progress picture or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so then I started posting more movement, like intermittently, I guess. Um, yes. Like when I was training for strong first, cause I was like, oh, this stuff's actually really cool. And like, this is what mm-hmm. I'm learning. It's really mm-hmm. interesting. Um, and then last year, 2020, when I was doing Katie St. Clair's program in power performance, um, I just started posting more like on my story, like of my training. And everyone was like, wow, that's so cool. I'm like, yeah, Katie's amazing. I learned so much from her and I did. And you should totally have her on. Um, but then I started posting more. I actually started doing these like full body Saturday movements. Um, mm. I was coaching a boot camp before, but with quarantine, we weren't really able to yeah. do that anymore. Um, right. but yeah, so I just started sharing it more. Uh, and then like just sharing kind of like my thoughts on like certain, you know, things that we see on, on Instagram or social media all the time, as far as movement goes that yep. could yep. be improved in my opinion, or just like kind yeah. of my understanding of how things work. Like mm. not not like I know everything because I certainly don't, but like when I learn something and sometimes when people say something, you can get one way of someone saying it and not yes. another. So it's just, right. it's useful to be able to like verbalize it and it helps me be a better coach just to like express through, through video, but also just like my, my cueing that I think of when I'm doing a movement, cause it can help other people too. Cause Absolutely. a lot of the time people like don't go to the gym because they're like, I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I just, and then I've just, you know, it's been like, I, like I coach on the side right now. And so, uh, what I started doing is I actually, I would post everything on Instagram on my story. And then whether or not I made a post, I would just upload that video to YouTube. I have like 1500 videos on YouTube now. Um, nice. Good. And yeah, it's just, it's a massive library. Like I just kind of yes. started, Hey, maybe I'll use this someday. Um, and mm-hmm. then I started coaching more and like through empowered performance, like Katie's done four cycles now. And like, there's usually like 50 women that do it. And like all of them are personal trainers or physical therapists or chiropractors or osteopaths, whatever yep. from all the world. And so it's just been this like sort of six degrees of separation, just like networking thing. Um, and so I think it's just been able, I've been able to just like sort of express my style um, and my reasoning and just like my training, like a lot of people probably think it's all over the place. Um, I definitely do a lot of like different things and variability, like, especially mm-hmm. on my Saturdays, like they're pretty much never the same. Um, mm-hmm. but like, I, I never take out deadlift. I never take out squat. I never take out bench. I never take out pull-ups. Like I'm doing all of my, like what I think are the core movements that are really important, but yes. I just think it's very important to be able to have variability as well. And so there, I'm always tinkering with different like ways of targeting a movement or like mixing it up. Um, just because I, I think it's interesting. And like, like I said, I'm building a library. So that's part of the reason as well, but yeah. And I'm not like right now I'm not following any specific, I program for myself. So I'm not following anything specific. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I feel better now than I did when I was like 18. So it's probably a good sign. That's incredible. And and people, that's another thing too. And that, that's a whole nother story too, but people can always say, well, you were young or like, or you're young. So that's why you don't have pain right now. It's like, well, how come I feel better now than I did when I was 17 or I was 18, yeah. you know, like when I played sports in, in high school, same, like I would have all these pains and this, this and that. And, you know, uh, even some of these injuries stopped me from even playing. So that, but now I go through a small injury perhaps because I knew I was doing something stupid or I knew I would overload too much. I knew form was out of the picture at that moment. And then I hurt myself and then now I got to deal with it. I know now how to recover faster from that and be able to still maybe do a movement around my injury, but not put as much load on, on that specific, you know, point of injury. But, um, now you just understand more. I think the more education you have about yourself, always the better, always. Sure. Um, but t- talking about all your stuff, where's the best place for people to find you? Cause obviously, like I said, that was what brought me so much attention to you was because I seeing all these movements and and they were just different and they help a lot of people. So where's the best place for people to find you? Yeah. So uh, my Instagram is megzi 72 That's M-E-G-S-I-072. Um, the reason it's Megzi, my nickname is Megs, but that was taken. Megs. So when I made my handle, that's what I, what my options were. Um, and I just haven't changed it. Cause I'm like, I could like change it to something fitness, but eh, I don't really want to maybe, maybe when yes. I, maybe when I'm a doctor, I'll change it to something like that, but we'll see. Doc um, Megs. My, my website is Barrington kinetics. So that's my last name. And then kinetics like movement. Okay. Um, 
and yeah, that's pretty much the best way to find me. I love um, it. I love it. To me on Instagram, I try to respond to everybody's messages just because I learned so much from people. Like people ask me questions all the time. They're like, uh, I don't know how to explain that. Or I don't know the answer to that, you know? So right, right. I've, I, it's been amazing to just meet people like all over the world this last year. So please reach yeah. out. Good, good. Yes, yes. And that's why I reached out to Megan myself. So you can go ahead and do it. Um, and th- that's the cool thing about questions. That's why I tell people all the time, ask the questions, because mm-hmm. if I don't know a question that helped me, not only am I going to help you now, cause I'm going to go research that, that question. And, but now we're going to help a lot of people who have that same question perhaps too, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, that's awesome. And like I said, Megan has some great stuff y'all. So y'all give it, we're going to put all the links that she just said right now, both of them in the show notes. Like I always say, check the show notes of the episodes because all this stuff is there for you to take advantage of. It's here for your benefit. So use them. Um, and it's, it's quick access to the you know guest speakers that we have on the show for sure. But uh, other than that, if you grab some value in this episode, all we ask is for you to simply share it to your best friend, your gym buddy, your mom, dad, cousin, uncle, someone. The more people get to listen to these episodes, y'all, the more lives we can all change together. And that's all we're trying to do is we're trying to inspire people to believe in themselves. But we had an amazing guest speaker today, Megan Barrington. And as usual, y'all, yeah, absolutely. Get out there. Train hard. And live strong. Yes. All right, everybody. (laughs) Peace. (laughs) 